there are these certain, extremely specific and monumental events in media, ones which you know you will never be able to experience again. Things like watching the Red Wedding for the first time, or being there for the basement reveal, or maybe even killing the Lich King. Something about these moments is just truly magical, because even while you're in the thick of it, you immediately know that history has been made. You know that no other piece of media will ever be able to replicate something exactly like that. And you know that from this point on, you will reminisce about this exact moments. One of these moments for me is Sabaody Archipelago and Return to Sabaody. Unlike many of the experiences I just mentioned, I was not up to date when it was first published. So my entire One Piece experience was rather a non-stop binge leading up to that point. But even when I was caught up in the absolutely wild currents that are the many stories of One Piece, as soon as I watched it, I knew this was it. This is that moment that I will be returning to time and time again. A belief that has now been proven right, with it, for me personally, still standing head and shoulders above every single arc in the series. You see, I was lucky enough to go into One Piece completely clueless. And by completely, I really do mean completely. I didn't even know it was a story about pirates. I just knew that it was a shonen, and that's about it. So naturally, I went into it expecting your usual shonen type of storytelling. A belief of mine that sort of held up for a little while, but not very well. Saying that though, on a conceptual level, the early story of One Piece was still a relatively straightforward tale of sequential adventures that were, for the most part at least, not directly affected by the events of the previous arcs. We certainly ran into trouble along the way, learned of many past tragedies, and even faced what seemed to be impossible odds. But ultimately, we just kept on chugging along. I mean, even as far back as Arlong Park, we had some of these side quests, with us initially just trying to track down Nami, but then ending up in a fight against Arlong himself. And then later on, we find ourselves in a very similar situation with Robin, but for a vast majority of the pre-timeskip story, we got back on track very quickly. And with this in mind, I think it's important to take a step back from Sabaody itself and quickly lay out the larger story beats at play. Because unlike with any previous arc, I think the biggest switcheroo happens as far back as post Tenny's Lobby, with it eventually creating this cascading effect leading up to the huge climax on Sabaody itself. I mean, as we all know, Oda is very much a long-form story enjoyer, right? Right on the heels of our literal declaration of war on the world governments, we take a brief trip back to Water 7, which is then directly followed by Garp's arrival. First off, it right away establishes the sort of dynamic we might expect from Garp and Luffy, something that would be very important with Sabaody, where he too would announce that he is going over there. Keep this in mind for now. Though far, far more importantly, just like we heard of the Grand Line being this mythical place way back in the East Blue, we get the lore surrounding the New World and how it is actually the final sea, very much giving us that sort of next northern star if you will. Though unlike with the Grand Line thus far, where we were sort of just going from island to island, we were also given a very explicit next goal, the scary spooky Florian Triangle and Bikini Bottom after that. So with our next goal in sight, we soon set off and find ourselves on Thriller Bark, an arc that was clearly set up as the obligatory Halloween slash Dracula slash Frankenstein horror story, but it of course would not be long until we learned that there is just some angry shallot head behind all of it. And so, it just turns into a good old fight. Except, not exactly. Because while we do get our now usual one-on-one -on -one matchups, such as the greatest fight in all of One Piece of God Usopp vs Ghost Girl Perona, the arc climaxes in what is, thus far at least, our one and only time where each and every single member of the crew has fought just a single boss. Not only that, it is also our one and only time where Luffy is given an entirely external massive buff that turns out to be absolutely instrumental in defeating Oars, already showing us just how thin of a line we are actually walking right now. If the past main arc antagonist would all be soloed by Luffy, then Oars took every single straw hat chaining their techniques together and an external power to beat, very much telling us that we are underleveled at the moment. And to top it all off, directly after the fights, instead of us jumping right into the joyous celebrations we all know and love, Kuma shows up and we of course get the legendary nothing happened scene. But all of this achieves a few very very important things. First off, Zoro going into Sabaody has already been absolutely annihilated. Secondly, knowing Oda's storytelling, Kuma appearing on Thriller Bark, by all accounts, should mean that we would only see him in like 300 chapters. Thirdly, we also get Big Mom's Viva card, which further sets up the whole, the new world is next vibe. 
But lastly, upon leaving the Florian Triangle, we are casually told that Thriller Bark wasn't actually the source of the legends, implicitly telling us that while what the Straw Hats did was remarkable, it wasn't quite as impressive as we might have originally thought, neatly setting us up for all of those ambitions to come crashing down. And as we actually get to Sabaody itself, we start to get a long, long list of red herrings and many, many subversions. Even before landing on the island itself, we see both Garp and Kuma, who would supposedly be sent to Sabaody. Kuma for not dealing with the Straw Hats on Thriller Bark, which, again, knowing Oda, I think it's not that wild to say that it wasn't entirely expected to happen, because, you know, it hasn't been 300 chapters, and Garp to deal with whatever is going on with Rayleigh. Knowing what happened in post Tenny's lobby, while they're both sort of looming omens in this arc, I wouldn't say that either one is entirely expected, and even if they are, now knowing that Garp is Luffy's grandpa, you'd also sort of expect their threat levels to cancel each other out, right? If only that were true for Ace. But yes, this marks Oda messing with our expectations numero one. And speaking of looming omens, we of course also have the Ace story going on in the background of all of this, with the actual news of what's going on with Ace coinciding exactly with the climax of Sabaody itself. It's not a subversion per se, but rather this stop-all moment for momentum going into the new world completely unchallenged. So to me, this marks cheeky Oda numero two. Somewhat akin to the horrors of Thriller Bark, we are also introduced to this horrific man Duval. Only problem is, he turns out to be no more than a gag, with him going on an incredible character arc of budget Sanji to handsome Squidward. So with that, we have instance three of Oda making us lower our guard. And it's then not long from when we land on Sabaody that we get to the auction, where, despite us hearing and seeing that challenging a celestial dragon is effectively a death sentence, Luffy punches Charlo's back into the manga, and immediately the auction is entirely surrounded by navy forces. But the thing is, despite that, we escape and everything is fine. Not only that, we make contact with the right hand of the literal Pirate King. Someone who casually showed off a power that we had barely ever seen before, and didn't even bother to help the now famous Sabaody trio knowing that they just don't need his help. Rayleigh's presence alone clearly indicates an insurmountable sense of safety, considering that basically everything about Roger thus far had been kept completely secret, us running into his vice captain of all people makes defeat seem almost ridiculous to even consider. I mean, sure, he's just one retired dude, but thematically, he is so, so much more. He represents the truest link we have ever had to Roger, the One Piece, and Luffy's ultimate dream, with Oda even going out of his way to deliberately remind us of the sheer determination Luffy possesses. When Usopp asks what the One Piece is, Luffy immediately shuts it down, saying that he does not want to know. Just like that barkey back in Logtown, absolutely all of this is setting us up for our entry into the final stretch of the adventure. We have overcome impossible odds before. I mean, our entry into the Grand Line literally involved Luffy casually announcing his death. So, with Rayleigh by our side, as well as the rest of the worst generation just hanging around here, we are just sort of vibing. But alas, comes the point where our luck runs out, and if the supposed villains of Duval and the Navy at the auction turned out to be not so dangerous, well then Strike 3 sends everything crashing down. Remember how I said at the top of the video that the only thing I knew about One Piece was that it is a shonen? Well, anyone who's watched Shonen will know that there is a very specific sequence of events that always happens in your typical three-act fights. In the first act, the protagonist seems to get a clean win. But then, something happens, and in the second act, he gets so close to the feed that it seems like there is no coming back. At the start of the third act, the protagonist screams three decibels louder and unlocks a new power-up that allows him to defeat the enemy. Copy-paste to literally most fights in anime, and you'll see this exact formula. For me, that was always the biggest problem with Shonen's. There are no stakes and none of it really matters. But oh man, no. It's as if this climax was specifically written to challenge every single one of those cliches from beginning to end. And all of that begins with the arrival of the pacifistas. Now, I'm not entirely sure whether this whole surprise was a result of me binging the series and everything just moving incredibly fast or was this intended. But with us cutting around to the various places on Sabaody and seeing multiple people fighting what looks to be Kuma, I always thought that we are just seeing events out of order. Not for a moment did I think that there are dozens of clones of Kuma running around and blasting everyone with lasers. Which naturally, then brings us onto the Straw Hats fighting one of the pacifistas themselves. 
the crew give it their absolute all, chaining their attacks together much like they did with oars. And after a long and grueling battle that took every ounce of strength the crew could muster up, we finally bring it down, only to realize that it is not even a person, but rather just a machine. And then comes the bombshell. Just as they're catching their breaths, Sentomaru appears with another one by his side. And just like that, all of those fights we saw go down were no longer isolated incidents. They were all happening at the same time. The Straw Hats did not achieve the impossible. They didn't defeat some legendary big bad. All they did was take down a lowly grunt, not even a human, one of likely countless machines sent off as disposable fighters. Just like we saw with us leaving Thriller Bark, no, we didn't vanquish some legendary evil. This was just a machine. And with that, we get what I still think is one of the most powerful lines in the series that even today sends chills down my spine. Luffy just says, we cannot win. The words neither we nor the rest of the crew thought to be possible coming from him. But he simply says, we need to run. This is the man who challenged the worst of the East Blue and won. He challenged the worst crime boss of Alabasta that ruled for years and won. He declared war on the world government itself and fought the worst of CP9 and won. Not for a second faltering in any of those events. Be it stabbed through the chest and left in the desert or beaten into the ground. Not once did he show the least bit of doubt in his abilities. So the words of, we cannot win, are almost unbelievable. No more than a few hours ago, he denied the truths of the One Piece itself handed to him on a silver platter. That's just how strong his drive is, yet here, he simply announces, we run. And as much as it is played up for gags just moments later, the absolutely chilling moment of Luffy of all people calling for a retreat is a very good indicator of what we should expect. And no more than a few minutes later, we see just that. Kizaru appears and in an instance shoots down Zoro, simply standing there as his identity is revealed to us. This is an admiral. Keep in mind that the one and only time we have seen an admiral fight thus far was Aokiji. Someone who wasn't even concerned with fighting the Straw Hats, but wiped them out while they were basically in prime condition without ever breaking a sweat. Well, now we have just faced what are two of our hardest battles nearly back to back. And on top of the ever-increasing number of pacifistas, we now have the strongest force of the navy in one of the admirals showing up to top it all off. At this point, we are not facing impossible odds, we are facing no odds. Yet still, remember what I said about the usual shonen structure. We just defeated one of the pacifistas, so that was Act 1. So now with everyone else showing up, this is our Act 2 and our crushing defeats, right? This is to be expected. And to immediately satisfy that thought, none other than Rayleigh shows up, very much living up to his name, and scatters Kizaru's light attacks, giving the crew a much-needed opening to run. So now we are back on track for our usual three-act fight, with the crew now regrouping, probably defeating another pacifist or something and just escaping. But that's when everything begins to unravel at the seams. As we see Chopper and Robin trying to escape, every single one of the Straw Hats are quickly defeated by the Pacifistas or Sentamaru, with even Luffy now laying in a pile of rubble. With no other choice, Chopper pulls his Devil Trigger and goes Monster Mode. A power so overwhelming and uncontrollable that Chopper annihilated a member of CP9 and then proceeded to attack Frankie. And with his monstrous roars now setting the scene, we see the completely decimated crew all laying on the floor while Usopp just tries to get them back up. And it is at this very moment that all of those dominoes Oda had set up begin to fall down. All of our fighters are defeated, Chopper has gone monster form, we have no means of escape, and Kuma appears, standing in front of Zoro, just like he did in Thriller Bark. This man, who seemingly spared Zoro, but then still chose to put him through indescribable suffering, now simply asks what is the most One Piece question of all time. If you could take a vacation, where would you go? And as much as this is a clue to what Kuma is actually doing, I do think that the sheer randomness of the question is Oda deliberately messing with her expectations. Because just as the potentials of what this even means begin to swirl in your mind, Zoro simply vanishes into thin air. No climactic battle, no build-up, nothing. He simply disappears right in front of Usopp's eyes. 
the second strongest of our crew, gone in an instant with absolutely no explanation as to where he might be. And as if this wasn't already puzzling enough, Kuma then jumps forward and erases the pacifista, seemingly helping the Straw Hats. So with what looks to be another opening, Luffy once again calls for them to run. But as Brook shoots out his one last pun, he too... Gone in an instant. Usopp shoots at him. Gone. Sanji launches himself with a kick. Gone. And yet again, we hear words from Luffy that seemed impossible. Not ones of encouragement or rage or anything, but simply, what do we do? And while we see Rayleigh still clashing with Kizaru, that much-desired Act 3 power-up seems to finally be here, with Luffy popping second gear and going in for yet another match. But no. Completely ignoring Luffy, he pops in front of Frankie and... Gone. And he then turns to Nami, who in complete horror reaches out to Luffy, simply screaming for his help, as she too... Gone in an instant. Oda's writing here is simply immaculate, because to me, it seemed pretty clear that he deliberately wanted to wipe out all the fighters first. Sort of telling us, well, it's what you'd expect. They are always putting their lives on the line, right? But when Kuma sets his eyes on Nami, there is no resistance. No final stand, nothing. She helplessly reaches out for Luffy, the man who freed her and her entire village from decades-long slavery. The man who completely changed her view on pirates as a whole. The man who had confronted the impossible time and time again and came out on top each and every time. Surely, if there is anyone who can help her, it is her captain. But no, in an instance, she is gone. Methodically wiped out, just like the rest. And with Oda already choosing violence here, he then goes with what is the purest form to convey Luffy's powerlessness. With Kuma just shamelessly disregarding Luffy's attacks. He doesn't even give him the respect of taking his blows, just effortlessly poofing around as if toying with him. As if deliberately forcing him to watch the torment of each and every one of his friends, for all he knows, die in front of his eyes. All while he himself is unable to do anything, the events just cascading before his eyes. And that is perfectly conveyed by Chopper, who is completely and utterly lost control, now running on pure primal rage alone. The power he is wielding, we couldn't even fully grasp at this point, but even that's gone in an instance. And we then see what is still one of the most heartbreaking scenes in all of One Piece for me. For the briefest of moments, we see Luffy clench his muscles, but then relax. That's it. He's lost. He has given up. Luffy has given up. He simply stands there, begging for him to stop. Just saying, stop, 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 over and over. Suddenly launching in his one final rush, not for Kuma, but for Robin. He does not try to win through strength and triumph, he knows he can't win. So instead, he just tries to save Robin, the only person he knows he still has. And just like with Nami, that sense of desperation and fear in her voice is just so much. Robin was not just ready to die, she chose death, but Luffy saved her. He gave her a reason to live. He did what she thought to be impossible, he challenged the world itself and broke into Eni's lobby. Not even to save her or even get her back on the crew. No, it was just to hear her say that she wants to live. With absolutely no ambiguity, he saved her life. And here she is, begging him to do it again. The world itself shifts in front of Luffy's eyes, all color becoming distorted and wrong. He simply falls to his knees, banging his head against the ground, helplessly pleading with the world itself and trying to punish himself for his failure. And as that cocktail of emotions swells up, one by one, all of them indiscriminately wiped out within the space of just a few moments. That Act 3 triumph I was eagerly anticipating never arrived. The reason why I say there will never again be an arc like Sabaody is because One Piece thus far was a 400 plus chapter stretch of impossible triumphs, the sheer length of which is unmatched by nearly any other series out there. But all of that led straight into a cold stone wall. All of that momentum we had been building ever since we first heard about the New World went up in smoke without us ever even having the opportunity to fight back. Kuma's power seemed so absolute that the concept of power as we knew it just did not matter. 
all of those lofty expectations we had constructed in our minds because of the way Oda writes his stories. Surely Kuma wouldn't appear so soon after we just met him, Garp would swoop in and save us, Rayleigh, the formidable right hand of the Pirate King is here, so surely he will save us. But no. Just like with the world twisting before Luffy's eyes, none of those preconceived notions held any water. With no fanfare, no build-up, no real significance, we are completely and utterly wiped out. And what you're left with is just about the most perplexing question you could ask in One Piece. What now? The defeat on Sabaody wipes the slate completely clean and gives us a much-needed wake-up call from what we've grown used to at that point. The thing with writing a cohesive story is that, by its very nature, you can't really write these sudden twists where the main characters are completely defeated and the entire story thus far is just completely invalidated. Well, you can, but then you'll have people criticizing it for being quote-unquote the most nonsensical and unrewarding ending. And while people like me would certainly praise it for having the courage to just literally cut the story short and literally say, yes, we could not solve all problems and the story ends here. It's sudden, it doesn't mean anything, but it ends here. That said though, I don't think most people would really be on board with that. So naturally, you must come up with some other form of challenge, which is where the whole three-act fight structure comes from. While very transparent when you really think about it, it at least gives you the illusion of constantly struggling to overcome the next challenge. But again, Sabaody is not that. It is not just a hurdle. It is a unambiguous, crushing defeat that completely throws the story upside down and begins what is yet another series of cascading events ending in complete disaster. I think many of us watching the story unfold after Sabaody always had the idea in the back of our minds that surely the crew would reunite very soon. Oda had meticulously crafted these characters, each with their own elaborate backstories and motivations for sailing with Luffy. So surely, somehow they'll all end up back together in like an arc tops, right? And that is where Sabaody sets itself apart once again. Exactly because Oda had put so much care into building up each and every one of the crew, he did have the confidence in largely removing them from the story outright for two years of serialization. Imagine watching one of your most beloved western shows only to have all of your main characters just disappear for two years. Which again, is exactly why I keep saying that there will never be a story like Sabaody even within One Piece itself. That is of course if Oda's most recent predictions about the remainder of the story are to be believed. But having the confidence and sheer wealth of story to pull something like this is a rarity. Where many other authors would be criticized for pulling cheap cliffhangers, Oda just straight up said, hold my beer, and gave you a two year long cliffhanger spanning an entirely different saga, following exclusively Luffy, through what are just about the most ridiculous challenges he had faced thus far. Because of the incredible world building, it allowed Oda to reintroduce characters long gone, immediately giving the world a sense of permanence and consistency. All of those journeys we went on are not disconnected events that we are now just supposed to forget because it was bad guy number 394. All of them bore consequences on the larger story and arcs like Impel Down demonstrate that brilliantly. Again, Oda is a very very long form storytelling enjoyer. So not only does Sabaody flip Luffy's story upside down, it largely also bleeds into resetting the entire world as we knew it, with nearly all of the antagonists we had faced thus far being unleashed onto the world yet again. But all of that pales in comparison to what we see in Marineford. At this point, we are following exclusively Luffy for the third arc straight, with I think many of us expecting for the crew to just somehow, through some shenanigans, ending up in Marineford. Oh boy, how wrong we were. The thing with writing defeats, and more importantly character deaths in stories that are not inherently founded on the notion of characters will die suddenly and regularly, is that you can very easily alienate a part of your audience. A somewhat bizarre conundrum that begin to transpire with the likes of The Walking Dead's TV adaptation. And so knowing that, many authors often consider killing off or just writing characters out of the story as a waste of potential that may eventually actually have catastrophic effects on the story as a whole. Again, keep in mind, One Piece is still a shonen. We certainly had our ups and downs and we were certainly used to seeing death in flashbacks. But in the present day, Luffy's story was always one of triumph. And as much as I praise Oda's writing, it is also hard to ignore that we all know Oda does not kill characters, right? 
And so after the devastating loss at Sabo, where Luffy's eyes were forcefully pried open and forced to see what can happen if they rush into battle, it was only natural for all of us to expect triumph in Marineford. And that is when Oda goes for the jugular, because exactly like with Sabo, that third act of expected victory is entirely subverted. Instead, mere moments after being freed, Ace is killed at the hands of Akainu, marking the moment where Sabo was solidified as the most important turning point in the One Piece story. The events of Sabo showed us that we are not ready for the new world, plain and simple. Even with our seemingly unwavering drive, there are simply threats that are too powerful for us to tackle, and Luffy was forced to find that out the hard way. But tragically, he did not learn. The rest of the Summit War saga is Luffy largely doing exactly what he has done before, only on an exponentially larger scale. He finds unlikely allies in Boa and the Warriors of Amazon Lily, breaks into Impal Down akin to our siege on Eni's lobby, and ultimately we take the fight to Marineford, with even the strength of Whitebeard's fleet standing behind our straw boy. But yet again, Oda told us that no, Luffy bit off more than he can chew. He is strong, but there are so, so many stronger than him. Sabaody was a warning of what could happen, with us in fact unknowingly being saved by Kuma. Well, in Marineford, we see what will happen when we rush in unprepared. The death of Ace in the story always seemed as a sort of a price to be paid for Luffy's survival. In Sabaody, his crew vanished in front of his eyes without a drop of bloodshed, no resistance, nothing. Whereas here, Luffy cradles his still dying brother in his arms. By forcing him to hold on to Ace's body, it almost works as this metaphorical anchor pulling and chaining Luffy down to the earth, no longer allowing him to shoot off into the skies as he did when their journey began. Had Luffy not faced defeat in Sabo, which then cascaded into this mission of fighting for his brother, he along with everyone else on his crew would have been crushed either by Surume or some other threat moments after entering the new world. Oda went out of his way to write an entirely new saga, to challenge that usual shonen storytelling and make Luffy run into a wall, not once, but twice, with one very simple goal. To break him down completely and reforge him from the ground up. Now much wiser and respecting of the world at large. On a strictly personal level for Luffy, the Summit War saga is nothing but loss. Nothing he does really changes the outcome. He does the impossible time and time again, yet still, his brother dies in his arms. Something that all of us know very well is that Oda likes his flashbacks. With almost each and every arc, we get a rich backstory for the main players in the story that then makes the payoff of said arc hit that much harder because we have a lot of personal investments. But with Luffy, things are once again much, much different. Because the flashback comes after the trauma. While many of the character backstories answer the question of how did we get here, Luffy's flashback more so answers the where and how do we go on from here. It forces Luffy back to his roots to make him whole again. The world kept spinning after the supposed death of Sabo, and it will keep spinning after the death of Ace. That pain is just something to remind him of why he keeps going. And having lived through two devastating defeats, the most important takeaway for him is that he can never let that happen again. The death of Ace becomes this looming specter, a constant reminder of what could have happened on Sabaody. Something that pushes Luffy to become stronger than he had ever been before, with only one goal. He will never allow himself to be as helpless as he was back then. And so, he sends a message. Both an apology for what happened, as well as a very actionable solution. We will meet back up in two years. Until then, I will become stronger. And while clearly both Luffy, as well as us following the story, all knew that they'd be doing the same exact thing and we'd all arrive back with a huge array of new abilities, from purely Luffy's perspective, this is not a call to action. He doesn't tell them to train or to get stronger or really do anything. The only thing he does is promise to them that he will be there waiting for them, strong enough to protect them from whatever comes next. I distinctly remember the shock I felt at this point, because again, even now we never got that Act 3 triumph. There was no grand comeback, no reversal. It was just us accepting defeats and agreeing to meet after a longer time span than we had even spent together. 
after four long arcs of following only Luffy, we ultimately return to square one. The goal of returning to Sabaody. Which finally brings us onto the arc that should have just been named Catharsis. And if for a lot of this video, I've tried to stay away from my personal oddities and focus on the narrative itself, then with Return to Sabaody, I am sorry, I simply cannot do that. At the very start of this video, I talked about those monumentous occasions in media. Ones which you share with your friends or even just others online. Well, with Return to Sabaody, I didn't really have that by design, as I tried to isolate myself from One Piece discussion as a whole out of fear of spoilers. But let me tell you right now, not once have I felt that level of anticipation while watching One Piece. To give you some extra perspective, and don't take this as me bragging that I'm some mega chat or anything, but I often meme about me having zero emotional capacity whatsoever. Like, I didn't cry once during the series. I just don't in general. It's just like there is a fundamental disconnect between media and real life in my brain. But do you know what got the absolute closest? Not Zoro's unwavering resolve and him saying that he'd never lose again. Not Nami's desperate plea for help. Not Chopper waving the flag. Not Robin. Not the Mary. None of that. It was simply the crew all reuniting. I will admit that I am oddly sentimental when it comes to any form of reunion. But with One Piece, it is not just a reunion, right? Can you name another series that has like a 200 episode stretch of non-stop tragedy only to reunite in the same exact place where it all began with that first crushing defeat and returning with such insurmountable power that it becomes almost a laughing stock? With the caricatures, there are the fake straw hats becoming a almost weirdly whimsical reminder of how it all started. The sheer catharsis moment of us seeing all the crewmates meeting each other one by one, as if not a single day had passed, but all being so different. Zoro of all people, casually stumbling into the bar first, announcing his return. Nami jumping up with excitement to hug Usopp. Robin walking up to the Sunny and greeting Frankie. All of these seem like meeting your best friends from high school or something you haven't talked to for years. But somehow, you reconnect in an instant. It's this magical feeling that only a series with as rich characters and with such a long-running story as One Piece could pull off. And that's not even mentioning the mentor relationship of Rayleigh and Luffy. The sheer emotional weight coming off of my shoulders when I saw all of them meeting back up and not just fighting back, but absolutely annihilating the thing that tore them apart? It's... It's a feeling that I don't think I'll ever be able to put into words. Even now, I get a weird tingle in my cold little heart thinking about it. But it's exactly moments like these that make me so, so glad that I experienced the journey that is One Piece. The reason why I say that there will never be an arc like Sabaody is because the duology we see here is the perfect embodiment of what makes the long-form storytelling of One Piece so, so special. It uses all of the many adventures and triumphs we had seen thus far to entirely subvert each and every one of those expectations, setting off a series of cascading disasters the likes of which we had never seen before or since. It gives us the perfect caterpillar to butterfly story, from Luffy's crushing defeat and losing a brother in his arms, to him finally being reborn anew, arriving back years later to where it all began and showing just how much stronger and wiser he had grown. It leverages the wealth of backstories and those inseparable bonds we had forged among the crew to give us the most indescribable feeling of catharsis. With them finally reuniting after hundreds of chapters apart, with each and every one of them now being stronger, wiser, and perhaps most importantly for One Piece, happier. The time apart, only strengthening their unity and love for each other. There are arcs that are more complex from a character writing perspective. There are arcs with many more reveals. There are many arcs with better fights, but for me, a certified suffering enjoyer, the defeat on Sabaody set up what for me is still the most special storyline to date. A reminder that no matter how bad things get, there are still those friends who will wait for you and have your back, even if two years later. And if that doesn't perfectly embody the story of One Piece, well then, I really don't know what will. And that's the video. Considering I just spent 35 minutes talking about it, normally I would say that I can finally stop going on about how people are sleeping on the absolute gem that is the Sabaody duology, and even more so, return to Sabaody. But you know, something tells me that inevitably, I'll end up revisiting this part of the story at some point again, because man, do I love it. 
Anyway, hope you enjoyed this little early surprise drop in celebration of tomorrow's manga return. In case you didn't know, I stream all of my chapter readings on Twitch and then later upload them on my second channel, Kuroto TV. so give those a look. All that said, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And let's also give a warm welcome to the newest member of the team, Avery Thomas. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye!